to tonight's options after the Leaving Cert 2022. So tonight we're going to have a number of presentations by my colleagues who will walk you through all of the different choices that your sons and daughters will have after they complete their Leaving Cert next summer. So in a moment I will talk about the CAO application process and how it works and part of this is two schemes called the Here and Dare Access Routes to Education. And Aideen will go through that with you. After that, Karina will talk through the options of maybe your son or daughter studying for one year, doing a post leaving cert course. And finally, Caroline will talk through other options like apprenticeships, the military and public jobs. So we'll start off tonight with the CAO process. So when your sons and daughters are choosing their courses for their CAO, it's vital that they do as much research as possible. So in class, they would have received a CAO book with all of the level six, sevens and eights that are on the CAO system. So at the moment, hopefully your sons and daughters are busy highlighting the courses that they have an interest in. Following that, then they should link in to the various college websites to get much more detailed information on the courses. Some of the students like to have the prospectuses in their hands that they can flick through. Um, and most of the colleges uh, still are giving the hard copies of their, their information. One of the best things that your son and daughters can do is to attend the college and IT open days. And during the month of November and December, these are all taking place. So every week on Teams, on the sixth year Teams page, we post the open days that are coming up the following weekend. So again, as I say, it's really important that they know in advance when the open days are happening so that they can plan to attend them, whether it's virtual or face to face. Over the next few weeks and months, if they come across anyone that's doing anything that they're interested in, maybe they could ask them about their job, what it's like, and um, how do they get into the job, the advantages, the disadvantages. And again, one of the best things that they can do is to find a student that's studying their area of interest. Most college websites have a dedicated page with student ambassadors or what they call unibuddy ambassadors. Again, where your sons and daughters can email the people doing the courses and ask them the questions. And they're the people that are taking the courses every day and they know what the exams are like, what the lectures are like, what the workload is like, and um, all the information that will help them make an informed decision. Again, because of we're in a digital age now, there is videos about everything available, whether it's on the websites or just simply going into YouTube and Googling the name of a course or the name of a career. And you're bound to find a few videos again that you can sit back and watch in the comfort of your home. So it's really important, as I said, that all of the notices to do with upcoming open days, events, webinars, talks, deadlines are printed every few days on the sixth year teams. So it's really important that your sons and daughters are checking that regularly. So moving on now, once your son and daughter has picked the courses that they have an interest in, then it's really, really important that they, they look at the detail of each of these courses so that they know exactly what they're letting themselves in for. So they shouldn't assume by the title that they know what the course is about. It could be very different in reality. So they might want to find out how many years the course is, how many years are they willing to study? At the moment, they're in a class of 270. So what's the class size like for the course that they're interested in next year? It's very important that not only do they check out the modules for first year, but for all of the years after that as well. And again, if there's modules that they're not sure about, they should be contacting the course leader of that particular certificate or diploma or degree to find out what these modules are about. And th that information is usually given out of the open day also. Is there particular options within the course? Sometimes courses in the first year are quite general and then they specialize after first or second year. Uh, is there work placement involved in the course? At what stage? Uh, is there an option to study abroad? 
what type of assessments or exams are there? Is it continuous assessment? Is it end of year exams? And where do the graduates go in these particular courses? Do many go on to further study? What kind of jobs they, do they go into? Do they travel with it? So once they know everything about the courses that they are interested in, then they can move on and find out about the college or the IT and checking out extracurricular activities, maybe their sporting clubs, what are the facilities like, um, and looking at things like the size of the college, would they like to go to a small one or they prefer a much bigger one? Do they want to be in a town? Do they want to be in a city? And obviously, depending on where the college or IT is located, will have implications for accommodation. So obviously, the cities are much more expensive uh, for rent than the more rural areas like Waterford and Carlow. So we see here that this um, picture here is the National Qualifications Framework. So this shows all the levels. And right now, the sixth years are at level four. So they're studying for their Leaving Cert. So when they have completed their Leaving Cert, they will get the equivalent to a level four. So after sixth year, levels five, six, seven and eight are available for them to apply to. Levels nine and ten would be postgraduate like masters and PhDs. So tonight um, in this CAO talk, I'm going to, co to concentrate on the levels six, sevens and eights. Later on, Karina will be talking about level fives. So with the CAO system, as I said, it concentrates on levels six, seven and eight. So I'm just going to run through each of these levels to explain what they are. So starting off with level six, they are your higher certificates. They are all two years long. The basic requirements to get into these is five passes. You're usually talking about passing maths and either English or Irish, and the points can range from six from sorry, 60 up to about 300. Your level sevens are your ordinary degrees. They are three years long. Again, you're looking at five passes, usually Irish or English and maths, and they sometimes have more specific requirements, like they might want a certain grade in maths or another subject. So you'd have to check out the individual courses. And the points for these range from two to 400 approximately. Moving on to our honours degrees, and they would be your level eights. These would be three to four years long, and in some cases a little bit longer than that. The basic requirements now are a bit higher. So you're talking about two or three honours and three or four passes. And then again, depending on the course, they could have particular specific course requirements. So, for example, they might want you to have a science subject of at least H4. They might specify what the science subject is, for example, chemistry. They might want a particular grade in ordinary or honours maths. Um, they might want a foreign language, etc. So these all need to be checked out. And the points range for your level eights would be anything from around 300 up to the maximum 625 points. So you can see here two lists in front of you. So this is exactly what's on the CAO when the students are applying. So first of all, they'll fill in their personal details, their name, address, date of birth, the school that they're attending, and they will tick number one box, which says that they're doing the Leaving Cert in 2022. And then underneath that, they will be given two lists. So it's list one and list two. And list one contains all their level eight honours degrees courses that they wish to apply for. And each student can apply for up to 10 of these. Then on list two, you have all your level sixes and sevens. And again, a student can apply for up to 10 of these. So that's 20 courses altogether. So when they're doing their research, they can bear in mind that if they have a lot of courses they're interested in, they finally have to narrow it down to 10 level eights and up to 10 level sixes and sevens. So the best way to fill it in, you'll see here now in the picture, is to put your dream courses on top. So in an ideal world, if the Leaving Cert goes really, really well for you, what would you really, really like to get into? So these would be your top courses. The middle section then should be your more maybe realistic ones, maybe looking at your results of your Christmas test, adding up your points and seeing where, where you lie and relating courses to that points range. And then at the very bottom, 
everybody should put in at least one banker or what we call a dead cert. So this might be a lower points course. It might be a point, a course that maybe doesn't have a, a maths requirement. So something that worst case scenario, there's a good chance that you would be offered that. So when you're making your choices, the golden rule with a CAO is to put your courses in genuine order of preference. I cannot stress that enough. It's really, really, really important. Students in the past have been disappointed if they didn't follow this rule. So your first choice is the course that you want to do the very, very most, followed by your second course, which is the course you want to do the second most if the first one doesn't work out. And the third choice is the third course you want, assuming that the first and second don't work out and so on and so on. It's really important that while students can look at the points of last year, they must ignore them for this year because points change every year. They can go up, points can go down and points can stay the same. And we have no idea what the points are going to be next year. So when you're choosing your courses, as I said, you've got two lists. You don't have to fill out both lists. You don't have to fill out 10 courses on each list, but we would recommend that students you know, do fill out their level eights up to 10 and definitely put down some level sixes and sevens. It just covers all scenarios. Each list in August is independent of the other. So a student can actually be offered a course from both lists. And when it comes to accepting, obviously you can only accept one of these. So at the moment in class, the students have um, been given the CAO presentation and they have done a demo CAO. So they filled it out um, as if they're filling it out for real. So we um, in class um, get the students to fill out the CAO form, usually in mid-December, early January at the latest. And by doing that, you get the early application fee of 30 euros. If you wait until the 1st of February, then the fee goes up to 45. So for their CAO appointments in December or early January, the students will need to come to the appointment or it's sometimes the registration is done in class with a credit or a debit card with 30 euros on it. They must have a valid email address and they must have some kind of a list for their level eights and sevens. They don't have to panic about this. Having one or two courses at the moment is perfectly okay. And at that stage, they should have an idea if they are eligible for here and there, and you'll, you'll hear that talk later on. Once the students apply in December, straight away they will get a CAO application number, and it's really important that they keep this safe. And anytime they want to log into CAO, right up until next August, they will be asked for the CAO number, their date of birth, and the password that they'll make up uh, at registration. So once the students apply in December, if they want, they can add courses up until the 31st of January. At that after that stage, the CAO closes down for a little break and then it reopens up again on the 5th of May, all the way up until the 1st of July next year. So there are uh, some courses that are known as restricted courses. These are very important to know about and they're highlighted in the CAO handbook right beside the name of the course. It will say whether it's restricted or not. So these courses are usually things like art, drama, music, architecture, um, courses that require an additional assessment uh, on top of the points. So the students must put these on their form by the 1st of February because the assessments take, play around, take place around Easter time, around March or April of next year. So it's really important that the colleges are aware that the students are interested in these courses so that they can be called for the next stage of the assessment process. If a student so wishes um, and maybe they're not successful in an interview or an audition, they can take them off their CAO. And if they want to move the, the course up or down their list, that's no problem either. But they must have the restricted courses on their CAO by the 1st of February. In May then, the students will be sent a confirmation of their course choices. And it's really important at that stage that they check all of the details, that they have the correct name, correct date of birth. Maybe if a student is exempt from a foreign language or Irish, that should be on their CAO at that stage. So if there is any difficulties, any problems, the student must contact CAO immediately. 
As I said, the students can change their mind all the way up until the 1st of July. Once the CAO opens up again in early May, the students can change their mind as many times as they want right up until the 1st of July. Once they change their mind and that's their final decision, it's really important that they keep a record of this because that is the list of courses that the CAO will have in their system. In August, then, you have the offers and acceptance. So CAO will offer courses and um, if the student is eligible, a few days usually after the Leaving Cert results come out in August. So a student, as I said, can get an offer on both lists, but they can only accept one of these offers. And um, these offers are usually accepted online and you're given a certain amount of days. And it's really important that the student accepts the course if they are interested in it within that time frame. Again, around the offer stage, there is a number of courses that are known as vacant places, or sometimes they're known as available places. So these are courses that have not filled all their places. And what they do is they advertise these places on the CAO website. So students who have applied to CAO and also students who have not applied to CAO can apply for these courses at that time, but they must have the minimum requirements for that particular course. So these are worth checking out in August. So maybe a student is offered a place next August, but has decided for one reason or another that they want to defer the college place for a year. So this means that they don't want to take up the place this year, but they want to keep it until the following year. So most courses will allow you to defer. And so once you are offered a course, you don't accept it you write immediately to the college and you ask permission to defer it. And once the college say that you can, then that place is kept for you the following year. So we're coming to the end of our presentation. So finally, your role as a parent or guardian. Please help your child as much as possible to research the courses. Ask them to tell you about the courses and, and really they should know their courses inside out. Encourage your child to apply early. And as I said, they will have the opportunity to do that in their career classes in December. Again, the golden rule is to make sure that the courses on the CAO are listed in genuine order of preference. It's the golden rule. Watch out for important deadlines. That's really important. And remind your son or daughter to read any email that comes in from CAO. And CAO stress that, that often students who make mistakes are the ones that were sent an email and didn't follow the instructions and didn't read the email. It's really important that they accept their offer online by the reply date in order for CAO to know that they want to keep the place that they have been offered. And certainly um, in the new year, it will be worth checking out accommodation early. Um, some of these will have deadlines and we'll let the students know in their career class. So finally, I'm just going to take my presentation down and I'm going to share with you the CAO page. And I'm going to just show you the dedicated section for parents and guardians. So if you can just bear with me for one minute. Okay, so here you see, this is the CAO website, which they have updated and it's, I have to say, it's very user friendly. So on the home page there, you can see just a little bit down, there are some nice tiles, very clearly labeled to what section um, they are about. And we're just going to look at the parent and guardian section there. So when I click on that, you can see that there is a guide for parents and guardians. So if I open that, there is, I think, a 16 page document there that will support you and possibly answer any of the questions that you might have. If we move on then to important dates, again, this opens up a number of pages. Uh, there's a whole page dedicated to college open days. There's the test and interview dates that I was talking about earlier on as well. So you can take a look at that there later on. Um, there's points calculator at the bottom and there's the demo that we would have done with the students. And I'm just going to go to the video guide and there is a number of videos there again that you can watch at a later stage. And I'm just going to show you if we go into the applying to CAO, there's a video here and I'm going to go to about eight minutes in where it's going to go through a scenario of a student and you're going to follow the student's path from the time she's applied to CAO to the offer stage. 
So I'm just going to move across here now and guess if I can get it at the right place. And we will play it. Here. We will now look at how places are allocated. We will look at the level eight courses, but exactly the same process will take place with the level seven, six courses and at the same time. The importance of you, the applicant, placing your courses in genuine order of preference will become apparent in the following example. When the examination results are released in August, they are entered into the CAO system. The CAO computer then checks that the applicant has met the minimum entry requirements for the course that they applied for. If they have met these requirements, a point score will be calculated. Then all of the applicants who have got a point score, i.e. those who are eligible for consideration for entry to the course, will be placed on a list which will be sorted in order of merit. The person with the highest point score for that course goes on top of the list and the person with the next highest score goes next on the list and so on. The admissions officers in the higher education institutions then tell CAO how many places are to be offered on each course. If the institution tells us to make 20 offers on this course, the top 20 people on the order of merit list will be offered places on the course. The 19 people above and the person in 20th place will all receive an offer. The point score of the 20th person on the order of merit list is the point score for entry to that course. If one of the top 20 doesn't accept their offer, then the person in place 21, who had fewer points than the person in position 20, will be the next person to receive an offer in the next round of offers. This continues until all of the places are filled or until there are no more eligible applicants to be considered for entry to the course. For an example, we are going to follow a particular applicant and this slide shows all of the applicants for CK101, Arts and UCC. The examination results haven't yet been released and the applicants are in no particular order. We are following the applicant in red. When the exam results are released, entry requirements are checked so those that have not met the requirements are removed and the remaining applicants are placed in the queue. We are looking at the applicant in red and looking at her course choices. And for demonstration purposes, we will follow the progress of her top three choices. The admissions officers in the first round of offers instruct CAO on how many offers to issue. Those marked in green have received offers. On CK101, they tell us to make two offers and the top two applicants receive offers. Our applicant is in the fourth position so she isn't getting a place on her first choice in this round. The admissions officers in UCD instruct CAO to make four offers on DN201. She is in third position on this list, so she will get an offer on her second preference course. AL850, her third choice. The institution instructs CAO to make three offers and she is in first position. She would be getting an offer However, she has already got an offer on her second preference and by placing DN201 as her second preference, that shows that she wants that course more than all the courses below it. The only course she would prefer is CK101. However, she doesn't have enough points for this course. She has enough for DN201, so she is offered DN201 and all of the courses below this disappear from her list of choices. So there are now just two courses in play on the level eight list. She has been offered DN201, her second preference, but she is still in the running for a place on CK101 if one becomes available in a later round. At this stage, she must decide whether to accept DN201. If she accepts it, it will not affect her chances of getting an offer on CK101 if a place becomes available in a later round. So she accepts DN201. When one of the applicants for CK101 doesn't accept their place, 
the institution instructs the AO to make one more offer in round two, and the person at the top of the waiting list gets that offer. The girl that we have been following was second on the waiting list, so she didn't get an offer in round two, but she moves to first place on the waiting list for that course. She has already accepted her UCD course, and she is in first place on the waiting list for the UCC course. In the third round of offers, UCC informs CAO to make two offers, as two applicants did not turn up for registration and two spaces have become available. Our applicant receives an offer of a place on her first preference course because she is first in the queue. Our applicant is now in the position that she can decide whether to stick with her place on DN201 or accept her first preference course, CK101. Okay, so I hope that explained the offer and acceptance stage. And if at any stage you have any questions, please do email your guidance counsellor. Um, I will now pass you over to Aideen, who will go through the here and dare schemes. Thank you very much for listening. Good evening, everyone. As Davin said, my name is Aidan Connington, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit this evening about Here, Dare and Susie Grants. All the information that we're going to talk about is available on the website accesscollege.ie, so you don't need to worry much about taking notes or anything like that, it'll all be available there, and it's pretty self-explanatory. So firstly, we'll talk about Here, which is the higher education access route. So what is it? It's an admissions route for school leavers for social, financial for, or cultural reasons are underrepresented in third level education. So it's basically trying to break that cycle and encourage children of uh, people who didn't go to college themselves maybe to, to attend third level. It was set up to ensure that all Leaving Cert students have a fair and equal opportunity to progress to third level education. So understanding the socioeconomic groups, in a typical Leaving Cert class, the children of higher professionals are significantly more likely to go to college than other socioeconomic groups. So 100% of the children of higher professionals go on to third level, whereas with non-manual workers, that falls to 23%. So here is trying to, to, to break that cycle and uh, encourage students from poorer socioeconomic groups to attend college. And then we have area profile, where in uh, Dublin 6, 99% of students go to college, no big shock there, compared to only 15% in Dublin 17. So why apply to here? So the first one, I suppose, the big benefit that um, students will focus on is the possibility of reduced points in the participating colleges, provided they meet the minimum entry requirements. And when we say that, we mean that if a student is applying for primary school teaching, for example, they must get the H4 in Irish. Um, getting here won't bypass that need, that requirement. And then when they go into college, they get supports, possibly financial, academic, social and personal, which is very beneficial. And then so to talk then about the reduced points, if a student uh, applies for a course with points are 366, an eligible here applicant could be offered a place with a lower point score, for example, 356. Uh, but again, they need to meet the entry and program requirements to be considered for a here reduced points offer. The amount of points a particular course is reduced by is dependent on, firstly, the number of overall places on the course, Secondly, the number of reserved here places on the course and thirdly, the number of here eligible applicants competing for these reserved places. So the more eligible here applicants competing for a reserved place, the less of a points reduction there will be. It's impossible to predict this one um, as they vary from year to year. So should your student apply? OK, the qu first question, was the household income on or below 45,790 in 2020? Now, that cap rises the more children that are in the family. Do you or your family have a medical card or a GP visit card? Did your parents or guardians receive a means tested social welfare pay payment for at least 26 weeks in 2020? Is their employment status underrepresented in higher education? 
have they attended a debt school and that doesn't apply because we don't have any debt schools in Gorey, but do you live in an area of concentrated disadvantage? So that's not necessarily a town, it can be an estate within a town or a particular part of rural Ireland that's considered disadvantaged. You must meet the here income limit plus the right combination of two other indicators to be eligible. That information is on the, the website accesscollege.ie. So if they meet the here, if they don't meet the here income limit, they, they just don't apply because they won't get beyond that. But if they do and they meet two other uh, indicators, then they should definitely apply. So how to apply? So firstly, apply to the CAO by the 1st of February. Now, we will be doing that with your sons and daughters in December in school. So that's nothing to worry about at all. They'll just be asked to bring in a payment card with 30 euro on it for the application to the CAO. When they're applying, they can tick the here box and they can go home with you and look at uh, the questions and answer them. They're very much personal questions to each family. So we, the school doesn't have a role in that. They complete all elements of the online here application by the 1st of March and then all supporting documents must be sent by the 15th of March. So how do I know what documents I need? And again, this is really straightforward and self-explanatory. So when they fill in their here application at home with you, they receive a checklist immediately at the end once they've clicked submit. This is based on the information that has been provided. It'll tell you what documents you need to fully complete your HERE application. And you should start gathering your documentation in a timely fashion, i.e. before the 15th of February. We'd say the sooner the better just to get it out of the way and then there's no stress. All documentation on the tech checklist must arrive in the CAO by the 15th of March 2022. Um, so helpful tips on this, study the HERE handbook carefully with your parents and guardians, complete the online application accurately, describe your parental occupation accurately as well, then get into the, getting the support, supporting documentation as soon as you can, good quality copies of all pages of the correct document and submit everything requested, have it in um, by the 15th of March 2022 and have proof of postage. So the most common reason for ineligible applications to hear in 2021 was because the applicant submitted the wrong revenue document. Now that'll be very clearly listed when they click submit on the CAO. So they, it'll be very clear to you what, exactly what you need, whether it's a P60 or evidence of a medical card or whatever. Um, so they will seek financial documents for 2020, for example, the statement of liability or self-assessment letter or notice of assessment. And then from the 21st of June, your son or daughter can log into their CAO application and uh, will find out whether or not they have been deemed eligible. It's important to remember is here is not the SUSE grant, it's a completely separate scheme. So if you apply to here, you should also apply to SUSE if you think you may be eligible. So I'll say a couple of words about SUSE and then we move on to DARE. So the key eligibility for SUSE are nationality, residency, Progression in education, which means that you're working from a level five or six or seven or eight all the way up. So you're moving up each time. It has to be in an approved college, an approved course. So uh, private colleges wouldn't be eligible for here. So it's important to bear that in mind. And then again, like here, it's an income limit. So the figures are depending on the amount of children in the family. They do vary and they're all available on the SUSE website. And that is just that you can do an eligibility reckoner on that, which is great. So you can put in your, your own details and it'll work out whether or not you're eligible. So on the CAO form, when they're doing it with us, they can tick the SUSE option. All that does is share that they're applying to SUSE to, with their college, but the, it's not an application. They have to apply and that's, that would be open at about Easter next year. And we'll tell the students in plenty of time. And again, return or supported, requested documentation, complete and on time. OK, so next, the DARE, which is the Disability Access Route to Education. There's more work in the DARE form than there is in the HERE form because there are three sections to it. So we'll just talk about that now. So DARE is a third level alternative admission scheme for school leavers whose disabilities have had a negative impact on their second level education. DARE offers reduced points places to school leavers who, as a result of having a disability, have experienced additional educational challenges in second level education. Now, what I would always say to students is it has to be, you know, um, something fairly significant. It's not going to be that you have the occasional sore back or a sore leg. It has to be something that 
uh, you know, they would have received um, treatment for and there would be documentation to, to back it up. So should they apply? So if the disabilities had a negative impact on their educational performance in school, if they are, may not be able to meet the points for their preferred course due to the impact of their disability, and they must be under 23, which is fine. So the disabilities, uh, this is the list, and um, if they fall into under any of these, then they can apply to DARE. So autism spectrum disorder, including Asperger's, AD, ADHD, blind or vision impaired, deaf or hard of hearing, DCD, dyspraxia, a mental health condition, neurological condition, including brain injury and epilepsy, a speech, speech and language communication disorder, a significant ongoing illness, a physical disability, or a specific learning difficulty such as dyslexia or dyscalculia. So the eligibility criteria, the first is that they have to meet the educational impact criteria. So we have to be able to show that it has had an impact on their education. And that can be done in lots of different ways. And it's, it's, it's on the form, but things like if they've missed a lot of time in school, if they haven't been able to, to maybe partake in extracurricular, if their homework takes a lot of extra time, um, there are the different criteria. Then the evidence is extremely important because if we don't have that or dare don't have that, then they can't know that the, what, what the student is saying is true. So you must have both to, to be eligible. Applicants must provide the required evidence of their disability and provide an educational impact statement from their school to be considered for DARE. So the educational impact um, and the questions we would ask then, has it impacted on a combination of the following? Have you received interventions or supports in post-primary school? Has it impacted on your attendance? or regularly disrupted your school day so that you may have had to leave school for appointments? Has it affected your school experience and well-being? Again, things like being able to partake in extracurricular activities. Has it impacted on your learning or exam results? And some students would say it takes them a very long time to do homework or to be able to retain information, so that would fall under that. Has it caused any other educational impact? And um, if a student is applying with a specific learning difficulty, is it severely impacting on their literacy or numeracy skills? The benefits of DARE then. So um, when they get to college, there's an orientation program. So that starts before everybody else begins. They're brought up and, and shown around and had to settle in. These are all optional, OK? So they can have learning support, assistive technology, library support, exam accommodations, an educational support worker and academic tuition. But it's really important to remember, you don't have to be eligible for DARE to get support in college. So when they get up, a needs assessment is conducted and they will be offered supports if they need them. So the benefits of DARE, like here, it's the reduced points and that's what all the students focus on. But we do have to warn them that we can predict the reduction and sometimes there isn't any reduction. OK, but we would hope there would be. But again, it's the same example of a course is 366, a DARE eligible applicant might get in on 356 but they also must need to meet, to meet the entry and programme requirements, like I mentioned about the H4 for primary teaching. The amount of points a particular course is reduced by is dependent on the overall number of places on the course. This is very like here again, it's the same thing. The number of reserved DARE places and the number of DARE eligible applicants. So again, the more eligible DARE applicants competing for a particular course, the less of a reduction of points there will be. So how to apply? So again, CAO form, you tick a box, um, then they complete section A on that form over the, you know, the next, maybe they get it done over Christmas, but it has to be done by the 1st of March and they need to start uh, gathering their documentation early. They say 15th of February, it has to be in by the 15th of March. The sooner the better, because it just takes the stress out of it for, your, for yourselves and your sons or daughters. And I think, I suppose, with the supporting documentation, that's where the parents um, really have a big role uh, in, in helping them get that together. So the first section A, the SIF supplementary information form, that's the online form. It's part of the CAO application. So they fill that in, they answer yes to question one, and then they answer the rest of the questions. Question five is a personal statement in which they outline the challenges they faced. Now, I would always say, and we would always say here, bullet points are fine with that. There's no need for this to be a big essay, just a few points on how it's affected them. Because we come back to that then in section B, which is the educational impact statement. And this is where the school has a big role to play. So the guidance, your son or daughter's guidance counsellor will organise this form to be completed. Uh, we talk to some of their teachers just to, you know, to work out um, 
what education and impact it's had. It's signed and stamped then by principal or deputy principal. And we, we give that back to the student and they send it to the CAO by the 15th of March. Section C then, as I said, this is where we need moms and dads to help out if possible our guardians. Um, the information on providing evidence of your disability is on the accesscollege.ie website. It's the applicant's responsibility to ensure all relevant documentation arrives to the CAO by the 15th of March. The deadlines are really, really strict. Um, so the evidence of disability then, this provides verification of your disability and helps to determine what third level supports they may need. So it can be an existing report or the consultant or professional can fill in an evidence of disability form, which we can print out for them. It's available online. That form has to be then completed, signed and stamped by the appropriate professional um, or accompanied by the business card or head of paper. Applicants with a specific learning difficulty, such as dyslexia and dyscalculia, are asked to provide a full psychological assessment of any age, completed by an appropriately qualified psychologist instead of the Section C evidence of disability form. So that's quite straightforward. Your GP may be in a position to complete Section C if they have the appropriate, appropriate information on file from the consultant or specialist. So the age of reports, it's important to note that applicants applying under the following disability categories, and these are ADD, ADHD, a mental health condition, or a significant ongoing illness, their reports must be less than three years old. Then um, psychological assessment. So applicants with dyslexia, dyscalculia, or any other SLD, they need a full psychological assessment report of any age completed by a psychologist and they also must have two literacy or numeracy attainment scores at or below the 10th percentile. So we can, those tests can be done in the school or they can be carried out by a psychologist. Helpful tips. So study the hair, their handbook carefully. That's online, OK? Select yes to question one on your CAO when you're applying. Ensure you speak to the guidance counsellor early about the education impact statement. So we need to know which of our students, and we probably know them all now, but there might be one or two that we don't. Make sure they tell us because we have a lot of work to do on that educational impact statement. It's quite a lengthy form. Uh, for the parents or the students then, request the required supporting documentation early, send good quality copies of all pages of the correct documents and submit all supporting documents requested. Again, keep proof of postage and remember deadlines, they are immovable with the CAO. Okay, and then common mis mistakes that affect their eligibility. So when the Section C form is completed by the GP, but the required copy of a report by a pro appropriate professional was not provided. If the reports are out of date, if they don't confirm the diagnosis of the condition the student says they have, if there's uh, incorrect, an incorrect professional completing Section C, or if there's some test details missing in the case of dyslexia. Forgetting to complete question one of the SIF by five o'clock on the 1st of March would be another fairly, fairly um, fundamental mistake. So they, that won't happen because we make sure they do it when they're doing the CAO. The DARE application outcome then from the 21st of June, exactly the same as here, they log on to their CAO application to, to view the outcome. Students can apply to both here and DARE and actually applicants who are both here and DARE eligible will be prioritised by colleges when allocating reduced points places. So that's great news for um, any student who, who will qualify under both. They're at an advantage there. It's not the SUSY grant, just as I said for, for here. If you apply to DARE, you should also apply to SUSY if you think you may be eligible. Now, uh, coming to the end now, there's a virtual open day or information day, should I say, on the 8th of January to Saturday, and it's from 10 till 2, and that's all the information you need and here and there, and we'd really encourage you to attend that if your son or daughter are applying. So remember, with here and there, submit it, check it, and send it. Further information on accesscollege.ie, it's a great website, all the information is there. And finally, thank you for your attention. And um, I know we would all say that please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, Carla will have all our contact details at the end. And now I'm going to hand you over to Karina Atkinson, who's going to talk about PLCs. Good evening, um, my name is Karina Atkinson and I'm going to talk to you tonight about the PLC, the Post Leaving Cert 
um, courses. So I suppose the PLC um, is a fantastic opportunity for young people to progress um, on from, from Leaving Cert. Um, I suppose many of the courses then are delivered through Colleges of Further Education. They usually last, say, one year. Some of them will be two years in length and they're usually running from September um, to generally early May. So about nine months kind of duration for the courses. Um, after one year, then the students will come out with a FETAC level five qualification. And I suppose this gives them an opportunity to progress into third level with this qualification or they can look at going straight into kind of the world of work. And I suppose the great thing about the PLC courses is that part of their programme is a work experience module, which allows them to link in with the industry um, to allow them to progress then maybe into that area as well. Um, the PLC does offer the alternative route to third level education through the Higher Education Link Scheme. I suppose this scheme, you know, allows students to apply through the CAO for level six, seven or eight programmes um, using their FETAC award. Alternatively, then they can go straight into the workplace. Um, and I suppose the good thing about the PLC course is too that it's not based on points. Um, they must yes completion of the leaving cert and there may be some particular or additional requirements depending on the program that they are looking to go into. So this is the ladder of opportunity. So when we're looking at um, the PLC, students will be coming in here at about the level five program. Some programs they can look at progressing in a lot of the PLCs to level six. Um, also, you know, they can come out at level five and they can apply for CAO and work into level six, seven or eight programs there um, through the CAO also. So it, it does open up a lot of opportunity for them. It also is a really good year for them to try out um, a programme and see is it something that they are interested in before they progress on to third level. The entry requirements, um, and again, it's important that you double check all individual courses. Um, each of the colleges will have online prospectuses. Um, so it's good to go into those and to check requirements onto their programmes. So generally the entry requirements would be completion of leave insert with specific grades and subjects required for some courses. There is a short online application. Um, sometimes the, the PLC colleges will require a personal statement. Um, successful completion of interview which we will help them with. So generally um, over the last few years, I suppose a lot of the interviews have been cancelled, but are they have been done virtually. So um, again, that will depend on the college that they're applying to. In addition, they may also need um, a copy of the most recent exam results, a reference, a CV, passport photographs, or, you know, if they're going for something in um, art, they might need, you know, small portfolio just to, to talk them through um, in their in their uh, interview. So the application process um, this year, there has been a new link put up on the CAO website. This link links the PLC courses and the apprenticeship courses, so it kind of gives you a link into their websites to help with the applications. Now, the application is not through the CAO. It will be through um, the website where they create an account on thisisfet.ie and they apply through this process. The colleges also have an apply section on their website. So at present, they can also go in through the colleges and press, you know, apply through the college site as well. Applications generally open from January onwards. Now I know already some colleges have applications open. So again, students can look on the college website and look and see, check if the applications are open for uh, 2022. When applying, students will generally need their PPS number and they will also sometimes need a medical card um, if they have one. So generally the application is free of charge, um, but a registration fee may apply then at a later stage. So I suppose initially the students will make their application. They will get a response back then from the college and they will possibly be invited for interview and then they will be offered a conditional place then on the programme. Um, 
and the, you know the colleges are are very helpful if you have any questions or queries you can contact them directly as well so i suppose why do students choose to do a plc course um i suppose there's there's quite a vast array of reasons why students would consider plc some of those reasons are you know they may not be ready to commit to a three or four year program um, and are a little bit still unsure of what they want to study or going into. Um, so they may find that maybe studying that area for one or two years gives them a good opportunity to make you know, a more informed decision. Um, if they are kind of not ready to move on to a big campus then and they'd like to stay closer to home, then it gives them a great opportunity to, I suppose, stay at home and to commute to the PLC courses as well. I suppose we're lucky we have, you know, Gorey School of Art here where students can, you know, go into, or we've Biffy, um, which a lot of our students would look at, and they would commute from Gorey. The bus goes from Gorey um, to Biffy every day. Now there is additional cost to that, but it's a really good um, facility there where, you know, students get in on time um, for classes as well. In Escorty also, I suppose, would be one of our um, catchment PLC colleges as well. So again, um, a lot of opportunity in, in there also. Um, I suppose other reasons, if they don't have the financial means to fund the cost of college um, or going to university, then you know, as the PLC is a good option. Um, they're still eligible for the maintenance, the SUSE part of the grant, um, while studying on their PLC course. Another reason may be if they did not get the points um, for the first choice at university and they, you know, want to decide to go through the fee tack link, then that is a good opportunity and a good link where it's not a guarantee. But a lot of students will progress from PLC into third level through um, the FETAC links. Some students might decide to the further programme um, to take a year out. So the PLC can be a really good opportunity, you know, even to look at a different area of study, to build on their CV. It can give them a good opportunity of, you know, even developing that little bit of independence and maturity over the year before they progress on to third year. And research has shown that students who come from PLC entry route tend to perform better in the first year at higher education compared to their peers. Some students will qualify straight after completing their level five and six and also go straight into the workplace. So there are some courses, you know, like the beautician where students will do their qualification in PLC college and then they will go straight into the workplace. And then, you know, the PLC for students who are looking at CAO applications, then the PLC is a really good kind of backup route there as well for them to consider um, as well. So the PLCs will all run open days. Um, a lot of them have been virtual lately, but hopefully we'll get back onto on campus. Um, open days as well. So it's good to link in with those open days and that gives the students an opportunity to visit the campus. It gives them an opportunity to meet the tutors and to you know, meet some of the students and to look at where they'd be studying the programme for the year or two years. So some well established and successful colleges of further education that we link into um, you know, and, and there are hundreds of uh, PLC colleges and courses around the country. Um, I suppose when we're looking at for students to be able to commute or, you know, um, a lot of our students will look at the Gorey School of Art, which is again here, you know, beside us at the Mary Ward, which has fantastic opportunities. Progression rate into third level from the Gorey School of Art is excellent um, also. Biffy, so Bray Institute of Further Education. So again, we have established really um, good links with, with Biffy. Um, they have always been fantastic to our students. Um, they are very open and supportive. They And they have a great um, array of uh, courses available to students there. In Escorty also, again, as students will commute and easy to commute in Escorty, have a really good selection of courses there to support students also. Um, some other students in the past have looked at Ballyfermot, Don Leary College of Further Education and Black Rock um, Further Education. Students will look to a lot there for the beauty therapy courses there also.
So just to finish up, um, on the CAO website, there is a link in to um, the further education and training options. Um, they also have a little video there which shows you, uh, gives you information about applying and the application um, and the steps that you need to take um, to making those applications for PLC courses. They also show you um, how to search courses and to identify colleges um, where your course that you're interested in is running. So I'm going to hand you over to Carl Ann. Um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about apprenticeships. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Carl Ann and I'll be discussing alternative pathways and options for leaving CERT students. I will try and be as brief as I possibly can. I am going to discuss apprenticeships at length. Um, other options that have been discussed um, have been post leaving certificate courses and I know Karina has covered that. Um, the other options that I'm just going to briefly mention would be the likes of the public and the civil service. And they recruit for local authorities, for government departments, for semi-state bodies, and they actually recruit school leavers as well as college graduates. Um, emergency services, fire brigade, ambulance service, security, Garda Shikona, Garda Reserve, prison service. For any of these roles, um, students would need to register first their interest at publicjobs.ie. And if there are any recruitment campaigns or competitions, they will be advertised on publicjobs.ie and then students would receive those emails via their inbox. And obviously there is a process involved, but there are certainly uh, very good options. In addition, the Defence Forces offer great opportunities for students. Um, there are many, many uh, different roles from recruits to cadets, um, working in the uh, Air Corps, the Naval Service, and also they offer a huge range of apprenticeship op options as well, from working as a mechanic, training you as a mechanic, to training you as a chef, um, as an aircraft technician, and many, many more. So I would really encourage students to check out that website and also to follow them on their social media platforms because they will and are recruiting and will um, advertise their competitions on their website. And again, all the entry requirements and all the details are posted on their website. Another very good option uh, for students are what we refer to as the Chagas courses, and they are all um, detailed on the Chagas website under the tab of education. And you will find courses there in Agri, in Equine, in Horticulture and Forestry. Again, the website is incredibly user friendly and it details all the entry requirements, the length of the courses and the qualifications that result. Um, just to remind you folks, we do go through all of this with our students in careers class and we go through the detail, I suppose, um, more slowly and so that uh, I suppose students can um, really, really see how to uh, register and um, look up the entry requirements and so on. Uh, another industry that might interest some students is fisheries and aquaculture. And again, I have posted the relevant websites there and they offer training opportunities also. Students might also consider um, if going straight into the workplace that there are lots of lots of industries and companies that offer training within their workplace. Uh, within their work placements. And um, just to mention one, Lidl is, uh, I suppose, great in terms of offering degree programmes in retail um, management. So again, um, I suppose they're, they're, I suppose, international companies um, and they have great career prospects. So um, worth looking at um, these options. I suppose, look at, we advise students to play to their strengths. They're all great in terms of their social media platforms. So if they're interested in any of these particular organisations to link in um, with them on their social media platforms, because that's when they'll find out about um, recruitment campaigns or, or competitions or job adverts. 
it's a very easy um, way to, I suppose, to get this information. Also, maybe a good idea, possibly during the summer, especially if you're interested in the emergency services, maybe to join a voluntary organisation, particularly the Guard Reserve or the, the Army Reserve or any of those listed on the slide. Just to kind of, I suppose, um, reassure parents as well, like our education system is built so that students can progress right up the ladder of progression. So um, whatever level they begin at, they can um, exit at that level and go on into the workplace. They can decide to come back at a later stage. They can go on and progress up a higher level and so on and so forth. So our education um, structure is built such that it allows students to progress and to move upwards um, if they so wish. So for the sake of just differ differentiating, when we when we talk about HE, we're talking about higher education and that refers to universities and institutes of technology. Davenant would have covered entry and application to these um, through the CAO um, website and they cover levels six, seven and eight. Um, when we refer to further education, we're really talking about colleges of further education, such as PLC courses, which are offered at level five and six, and also apprenticeships, which are which run across levels five right up to the top level ten. Um, the CAO has been mentioned previously by Davenet as the way, as the entry portal to apply for higher education, but it also is a one-stop shop for further education courses and allows you to go, um, you can go into the website and also um, look up apprenticeship courses, but you cannot apply um, for an apprenticeship to the CAO website, just to, I suppose, just to clarify that because there could have been some confusion around that. So I'm going to focus, um, I suppose, the rest of the presentation on apprenticeships which is a really exciting area. This is the website that is really, again, the one stop shop and it contains all the relevant information about apprenticeship opportunities. Just to remind you what an apprenticeship is, it is a program of structured education and training which formally combines and alternates learning in the workplace with learning in an education or training centre. So it's a dual system where you have on the job employer based training and off the job training in an educational institution. Um, it's industry led by consortium industry and education partners, and it can lead to any from levels five to ten on the national framework of qualifications. It can take up to some apprenticeships can be two years, some can take up to four years, but the minimum is 50 percent on the job training. And again, you can go into the actual website and see the whole host of different um, uh, apprenticeship uh, opportunities. And there's a list here, but if you actually go into the website, you can see them in more detail. You can click into them. You can see all the, the, the specific details and information, every single apprenticeship. Um, opportunity is listed on the website and you can go in and you can see what it's about. You can see what um, it, it might be required. You can see relevant websites that you can look, look up or emails that you can send information to. But there is, as you can see there, there is a whole host of opportunities from insurance practice to accounting technician to healthcare assistant. Um, right, you know, um, true to the craft apprenticeships, the carpentry and the plastering, the plumbing, um, aircraft mechanics, um, you know, retail supervisor, recruitment executive, so many in terms of financial services. So there is a whole host of um, apprenticeship opportunities out there. And I suppose in, in terms of talking about the real advantages, because there are so many advantages in terms of doing an apprenticeship, I suppose the big one is that you, the, the student is earning while they're learning. So you earn while you learn through the whole process. So whether you are on the job or whether you are in your educational work placement, you are earning um, you are earning a wage and that increases as you progress through your apprenticeship 
program and all those specific details are listed under the specific apprenticeship on the apprenticeship.ie website and we go through that with students in class and we give them time to familiarize themselves with the website and so on and so forth look at just other advantages folks um that i i really want to share with you in ter in terms of considering an apprenticeship option is that as you can see there there are 60 plus apprenticeships to choose from from a whole range of of of, of um industries um you know once you have an apprenticeship and you qualify there's so many opportunities to travel <coughs> because the um qualifications are internationally recognized a student can set up, you know, once you qualify, you can set up your own business, work as a sole trader. Um, the other wonderful thing about an apprenticeship is that you don't necessarily have to start um, after school. You might delve into a different area and then decide in four or five years time you would like to um, upskill or do something else or change your career pathway. So again, it's a great opportunity maybe down the line to consider. Um, <coughs> Um, unlike sometimes completing a, a, a college course with an apprenticeship, you're actually job ready. They're job ready qualifications with a track record of work experience, which is indeed um, a fantastic boon. Um, training is provided by industry professionals and they are no doubt um, experts in their own field. There's excellent career progression and links to higher education, which I would have mentioned earlier. And um, the good news is that there's a 114 increase in women in, 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 in working and qualifying in apprenticeships, which I think is fantastic news. Entry requirements again, folks vary, and we would show students in class how to look those um, specific entry requirements up on the actual apprenticeship website. So they would go into the apprenticeship option that they're interested in, and it is all detailed very logically and um, very well on the website in terms of what are the entry requirements. For the traditional craft apprenticeships, the electricians, the plumbers, the carpenters, the stonemasons, the block layers and all these um, uh, skills which really are in short supply and 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 very very needed at the moment. Um, the minimum age for a lot of these apprenticeships would be um, 16 and that you would have a grade D in five subjects in your junior search. So I suppose the big question is how do you apply for an apprenticeship? Um, this is, I suppose, slightly the, 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 the trickier part. The first step really is to find a potential employer. So now, how do you find a potential employer? So obviously, look locally, um, job adverts, uh, irishjobs.ie, obviously your library, maybe someone in your local community, you Google uh, jobs in your local area, or uh, another great option is actually to go back onto your apprenticeship.ie website, and there is a complete, an entire section there on um, where uh, employers would post up to date um, jobs. So you can go in, click on a job or an advert that interests you and it will detail how you might apply. Now, again, obviously we want our students to complete their leaving cert at this point, but there is no harm looking and dipping in and contacting potential employers that might be recruiting at the moment and uh, informing them that you are currently sitting your leaving cert, but that you may be available to start in the summer months. Again, we would encourage students to follow um, Generation Apprenticeship via Facebook, Twitter, all the, you, you know, the social media platforms. You can connect with your local apprenticeship provider, which for us is the Wexford Waterford ETB, and the details um, and the contact details are below on the slide. Again, you can find all this information very readily on the www.apprenticeship.ie website, which indeed we will be sharing and detailing with our students in class. Also, um, I thought it might be a good idea to list some of the other um, I suppose uh, useful websites. Um, again, you know, 
listen out for, I suppose, national recruitment campaigns and drives. You know, um, we would have a number of students who would have been recruited by ESB networks um, in, the, in the last number of years. So there's great opportunities there. Um, also, you know, um, the Construction Industry Federation have, have a very good website. Look, there are just so many insurance practitioner, laboratory technician and um, tech opportunities. Um, Bus Aaron are off, often um, publish recruitment drives for heavy vehicle mechanics and so on and so forth. If you would like a copy of this presentation, please do not hesitate to email me and I will be um, showing you our email addresses in, I think, the next slide. Just before that, just some other maybe useful websites, folks, that you might like to dip into. In particular, can I highlight there is suzy.ie, and this is the website we will be sharing with students. And it's, this is very important in terms of looking at financial assistance whilst in the college. There are lots of supports in terms of an apprenticeship because you get paid while you're in an apprenticeship. And also, um, depending where your placement is, you would get um, maybe some money towards accommodation and also transport. But in terms of doing a regular college course, um, it is incredibly expensive. So some students might be eligible for what we refer to as a SUSE grant. We will be doing all of that with our students in class um, around May when the application process opens and we will be um, advising students what the cutoff rates are and whether their parents, whether you might be eligible or not. We'll be showing them how to find out that information. So folks, um, that was a very quick run through in terms of possible other options for your son or daughter. What I would say to you is, look, please feel free to contact um, your son or daughter's guidance counsellor. Just ask them who that person is. Uh, if you have any queries, you'd like further information, you'd like to call or email us, our email details are below, or you can ring us on the school number and just ask for um, the relevant guidance counsellor. I hope this was helpful and good night and take, take care.